the next panel, we're going to talk about uh, resources and the policy issues that arise. And many things surfaced in the last panel, so I think there's lots for you all to talk about. I'm really excited to have Lori Harding here today to be our facilitator. And everybody knows Lori, right? <laughs> but Lori is the co-director of the Upper Valley Community Nursing Program. And for 10 years, she served in our state legislature. So I can't imagine a better person to have this conversation. We are so excited that Lori ends her, lends us her expertise in uh, healthcare policy as well as elder, elder issues um, to the Alliance for Healthy Aging. So please join me in welcoming the panel. First of all, I'd like to thank the panel for their really poignant stories. That was just a really moving experience, and you've given us a great lead-in for some of the things that we would like to talk about now. And Leslie, I have to say, I will never forget the day you said to me, you know, a healthcare provider has never asked me how I am doing. And I'm a nurse. I was so embarrassed by that very simple question that could have made such a difference for Leslie and what she was dealing with. And I'd like to say special thanks to the endowment for, I guess, taking the risk of focusing on caregiving for its annual meeting. I think that was thinking out of the box, and it's a very unusual topic for an annual meeting, but such an important one as we talk about aging in New Hampshire particularly. So a geriatrician friend of mine said to me not too long ago that 60 is the new 40 and 85 is the new 84. <laughs> so, in just to put that thought into some frame of reference, by the year 2030, New Hampshire will have the largest number of 85-year-olds per capita of any state in the country. And here we are in New Hampshire, but Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, in that order, are the oldest states in the country, Maine being number one, New Hampshire being number two, and Vermont being number three. We have some major challenges in front of us. We're gonna have many, many people needing caregivers. So just so that you really understand the situation we're in, we have a moratorium in New Hampshire on nursing home beds. No more nursing home beds. If you are on Medicare and you've come home from the hospital, you can be eligible for in-home care services, providing that you're homebound and you have an acute skill need. But those services are short-lived. As soon as your wound is healed or you're back up and ambulating appropriately, Medicare will no longer pay for those services. If you are income eligible for Medicaid and have uh, conditions that would make you eligible for nursing home care, you can receive a waiver at home and receive Choices for Independence, CFI. So if you're income eligible or if you have an acute care need at home, you get services. But if you're anywhere in between, there are no services available for you. And as we look at our demographic change in the state, we've got some serious things that we need to consider. These are economic issues, their housing issues, their transportation issues, their education issues, their recreation issues. It's not a mistake that over at Lake Winnipesaukee, they're building more pontoon boats than they are cigarette boats. So it requires us, yes, it requires us to really rethink how we're gonna do business in our state. And right now, there are very few policies in place to address those needs. So if you're in a small rural community, if you're in a municipality, if you're working at the state level, we all need to be thinking about what we're looking at for the future. So we're very lucky to have three panelists that are gonna help address some of these issues. And our goal here is to really help you think about sort of reformatting what you may think about as aging and not think for today, but think about for 10 and 20 years from now and also for you to understand a little bit more about the solutions and some of the resources that are available. So we've got three panelists, and the first one, I'm gonna just introduce all three to you and have them each talk for about five minutes. 
to seven minutes. And then we're gonna have questions from all of you. And I would ask that when you ask your question that you either address your question to one of the panelists or you can ask for all three to respond to your question. But be thinking as we talk about what questions you may have about what is lying ahead for all of us. So the first speaker will be Dr. Hanuk Hong, and he is a family physician from Concord Hospital. Concord Hospital's got a wonderful community program for frail elders, and Dr. Hong is very active in that program, and he's got some very thoughtful comments about caregiving. And then Gretchen Grosky. Gretchen's gonna help you look from a little bit bigger perspective, really the state of New Hampshire, because Gretchen is a solutions journalist for the union leader. For those of you who've seen Silver Linings, the, the series that the endowment is helping to sponsor, Gretchen is the author of those articles, so we're very pleased that she's here with us this afternoon. And she's got a bigger view of New Hampshire. Dr. Hong has got an individual perspective, Gretchen has got a statewide perspective, and then we're fortunate to have Jess Maurer here. Jess is the executive director of the Maine Council on Aging. Did I get that right? Maine Council on Aging. And more importantly, as far as New Hampshire's concerned, she's the chair, she's actually the innovator and the director of the Tri-State Learning Collaborative on Aging, which has pulled together Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont because we have so many similar challenges ahead of us. And together, we're looking at solutions. We're particularly looking at aging and community. And Jess has helped facilitate that. And she's in a very important role because Maine is a few steps ahead of New Hampshire in terms of how engaged they are, both with their policymakers, but also with their communities in addressing some of the changes that need to happen. So we're learning a lot from Maine. Vermont's learning a lot from Maine. And so we're very grateful that Jess drove over from Maine in this lousy weather. So thank you to all three of you for being here, and let's get started. Hanuk. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, and thanks uh, to the endowment for uh, this definitely uh, humbling. It's an honor to be here today. Um, you know, I guess I could speak from a perspective of being a physician, uh, but I don't have any uh, you know, I've, I don't have any family members that were ever a, in the healthcare field, but I will say that about 15 years ago, I was a family caregiver as an adolescent. Um, I've been in Concord as a family physician for five years now, and it's been a privilege to, to, to be able to care for seniors in the community, um, as well as their family members, uh, some who are on my patient panel as well. It's the, the experience that I've had, uh, it was, it's been just gratifying because I felt that there are, um, that the, I felt that my past experience of being a family care, caregiver has positioned me to be able to at least have that different lens um, as a provider. Um, there's two things that I wanted to share with you that I've learned uh, from being a physician, caring for those um, patients and the families. Uh, one is that caregivers, they work hard, and they're change agents. What I mean by that is when I visit a patient's home, uh, someone that has a, a recent fall, and I see remote controls, say, three or four of them in a living room, um, or if I see juice containers in several areas of the home strategically placed. You know, um, I know that they do hard medical tasks. Um, they're asked to do a lot of difficult tasks, but they do much more than that. They, you know, they're change agents. They, they, they look for ways, because they love their loved one, that they, tr you know, they, they look to continuously improve on their caregiving role um, to prevent that fall. Um, the other thing that I've also learned is that, just as I saw my own father, um, there's a lot of caregiver self-neglect. The stories I've heard, um, one patient's caregiver telling me that every two weeks she stops by the side of the road, pauses, and just cries 
and then she goes back home. And she says she's going to make it another one to two weeks. Um, all these caregivers that I've uh, come across, I've learned just having the, from the healthcare point of view, that they don't exist. They don't exist in our healthcare records um, because there is no unified caregiver identifier in the charts. Um, also, I think that there is a lot of improvement that the healthcare side can make to help connect patients and their families to the resources that's really needed in the community in a timely fashion. Um, so, you know, I will end with this, that over the f five years, I've had adolescents uh, who would share, who would tell me that they're not able to go to summer camp because they, you know, they want, they love their grandma and they want to stay and they want to help um, when they're not in school. Um, I've also heard adults um, who not only work but care for their children as well as their own mothers. And I've also heard uh, partners of patients who say that, um, you know, that they'll take care of themselves after they uh, take care of, they make sure that their loved ones are healthy and safe. Um, so, you know, this is just very emotional for me because I, uh, I feel like there's so much energy to, to help uh, family, just caregivers, care partners, and um, I know there's a lot of work to do, but it's, it's very motivating um, just to be here with you and working on it together. Thank you. I just wanted to add that when we were talking the other day, Hanuk said that caregiving should have its own diagnosis, which I think is a really good idea, given how many emotional and physical and um, side effects of stress people probably experience in the line of doing that important job. So thank you, Hanuk. Gretchen. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Gretchen Grosky, and I was the aging reporter with the union leader until somebody pointed out what a horrible name that was and said, how can you deal with reminding yourself every day that you're aging? And uh, he nicknamed me the reporter on aging issues, <laughs> which is definitely more palatable. Um, I want to apologize up in advance. I am a reporter, so I'm usually sitting out there and writing things down. So I have my crutch in my hand, and I may have to refer to my notes. Um, uh, those last speakers were absolutely incredible, and to be able to get up here and speak from the heart like that is not a, um, a, not a uh, talent of mine, so I may be relying a little bit on this. Um, my position at the union leader um, as reporter on aging issues uh, is the result of the innovation of the union leader, uh, my boss, Trent Spinner, as well as the Endowment for Health that partner together, recognizing that New Hampshire is graying, it's presenting its own challenges and its own problems, and that the only way to change the conversation is to bring about the conversation. So together, they've um, really brought the topic of aging over the last six months into the public forefront by putting it on their front pages and getting people talking about it. And we do this in a little bit of a different way. You look at newspapers and journalism in general, they like to highlight the problem. My goal here is, as a solutions journalist, is to look at the problem through potential solutions. And we've nicknamed this series Silver Linings, which is to hope to convey to people that this is not a doomsday diagnosis. This is a starting point where we can talk and we can change and look for the positives in what a graying state means. Um, and when I first started this project about six months ago, I made a mistake. I, I took the wrong approach and I started looking elsewhere in the country for these types of solutions that might help New Hampshire in dealing with its aging population. Uh, and then I quickly realized that these silver linings are everywhere in New Hampshire. Uh, in every corner of the state, people are recognizing this and addressing it in different ways. And 
a lot of the way the, that these solutions have come about, these silver linings, have not been about somebody asking for help because that's not how we Northern New Englanders do it. We don't <laughs> ask for help, but thankfully we have people in our communities who are recognizing these issues. Uh, they see a need and they find ways around it. Um, some of those, uh, those silver linings that have come out of that, um, I'll highlight um, people like, I'm gonna butcher his name, Woody Sponogle of Rye, who was a caregiver to his wife. And as a man, he said, my approach to things is to fix it. And this is a situation that I can't fix, but that's how I, take, that's how I view things. So he started a support group for men where they talk differently than the way women may talk together. They talk about fixing it in ways that they can, they can do it together and they found solace in each other and help in each other that way. Um, the Gibson Center in Conway, um, a fantastic senior uh, center program up there serving the Conway area, um, recognized that there was not an adult daycare in the area to help caregivers get a little bit of respite. Um, they looked into it, it was expensive, there were zoning rules, it just, it, the obstacles were too insurmountable. So they found their own way. They offered a fun day, two hours, a, uh, two hours for two days a week where you can drop off somebody so the caregiver can take that little bit of a break. Um, I recently worked with a, um, a great guy by the name of Al Latulipe, who is providing boxing classes to people with Parkinson's. And this was all about from a man who came to him with Parkinson's and said, will you train me? And his response was, in his head, was hell no. But I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna give it a try. And as he learned, he said, these people are, and he watched videos on it, the Rock Steady program. He watched it and he said, these people are training like the amateur and the professional boxers that I train. And as a result, he's built these classes in Concord to provide uh, physical training to people with Parkinson's, but the, the opposite result happened was that the caregivers were coming. They were getting a two-hour break, like a, a woman by the name of Renee Doucette, she takes her mother there twi uh, once a week for two hours, and while her mother takes the classes and helps herself, she's spending those two hours doing homework and studying to become an LPN. Um, and then there are people who, um, like Dominique Boutard, who is an amazing artist from France who now lives in the Nashua area, who saw the need and spent the money out of her pocket to become certified in teaching creative arts to people with dementia. And now she's offering classes to either the caregivers or to the persons with dementia um, or together as a way of stress relief. Um, and I, 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 there's people too that just really move you who may not have a, um, a program, but people like Cindy Sleeper of Guilford, who just talked openly and talked genuinely about how hard it is to have a family member who has Alzheimer's at the holiday season and having them be there but not present for the holiday, and how do you honor the rest of your family? How do you, how do, you do that? And I saw that as a silver lining because it's just talking about it. And she said once she started talking about it, she realized that there are so many others like me out there. And it's okay to talk about it, and that's help in itself. Um, I think the conversation has started to change. I think people are looking at solutions. I will um, tell you, I had a great um, snowy day I spent with the um, Upper Valley Community Nursing Project where I got to spend some time with the community nurse of Thetford, uh, Cindy Greg. Griegel. 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 And she's in Thatford, Vermont, and she took me to see a woman um, whose husband had passed. And Cindy was there from helping this woman you know, with her husband, teaching him how to take care of him, to roll him in the bed, to help her with medication, to help her go through the hospice situation. And I just was able to see that this community nursing project wasn't necessarily about the patient, it was about the family and how involved they got. 
And this was a program that was funded through donations, funded through grants, and the story ran maybe a week and a half or so before town meeting. And for the first time, the community nurse of Fetherford was going before the town and saying, just give us a commitment. Give us $3,500 just to show that you're interested. Well, community uh, nurse came up at town meeting, and rather than uh, people looking and saying we should cut the money, someone stood up and said, uh, 3500 that's all you're asking for? And the community residents of Thetford turned around and gave her $8,000 instead of the 3500 I have to say that the community nurse had on an old nursing uniform and her old cap. And she said, yeah. she said, if you recognize this uniform, you're old enough for me to take care of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are other, there are easy, um, simple things that communities are doing uh, up in Conway as well. They have this thing called Project Good Morning. It is a um, program that the police department offers. They've been offering it since 1976, where if you're um, an elder living at home alone, you pick up the phone and you call the police department every day just to say, hey, I'm okay. And if they don't get that phone call every single day or the day they miss, there's a police officer at that doorstep. Um, it's a simple community-based thing that as a result of the story I know of at least three other police departments who are looking and asking Conway about how do we do it in our own community. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, our work here with the endowment and with the union leader is um, helping to change the conversation and I really, it's been the most enjoyable experience. I've been telling people, I said it's the first job I've ever had where as a reporter, people don't go running from me in a room <laughs> or uh, <laughs> and actually complimentary. So um, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate being part of the conversation. I appreciate being here today. Great, thank you, Gretchen. <laughs> Jess. I want to be Lori, you can tell I'm dressed just like her. <laughs> Maybe I want to be you, oh. and be dressed just like you. So I'm, I'm really psyched to be here today, uh, and I also just want to say I'll also thank you to the Endowment for Health for, um, and it's not just me being the innovator, um, but you know, Kelly and I really kind of came up with this idea that since we were in the same demographics stew together uh, across Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire, uh, and since so much great is happening here in New Hampshire and so much great is happening uh, in the other two states uh, that we could magnify that, right? I mean, so we can really, we can make this happen faster if we can tell the good stories about what's working. Um, and I think the question that this panel was, or our, our name was, sir, why do we have to change the discourse on aging? Um, and, you know, if, if I had to boil it down to one word, I would say it's the economy. Uh, and, you know, we have uh, some really incredible challenges in our region that we know about, sort of, but I venture a guess that you don't all know about them, uh, and we all don't know about them, and more importantly, a whole lot of um, people out there in the world don't know that it's not just uh, that we have a lot of old folks, it's actually that we're living longer than ever before, which is great news, right? I mean, this is good. Um, but we also just haven't had enough babies. Uh, and so that's really the, the crux of the problem uh, is that we don't have enough young folks. We don't have enough workers. Uh, and you pile on top of that, and how many times have we heard it in the last two hours? Yankee independence. It's, I tell you, it's the worst thing there is going on. And, and so this is why we have to change the discourse on aging because Yankee independence moves us into crisis. And that's the way things are going. It's the stories we heard a lot of, although not, Leslie, thank you, You're, you guys are doing a great job planning. <laughs> but a lot of caregiving, uh, whether that's your spouse or your parents, or really, comes from a place of crisis. Uh, and so that is driven by, and I talk to old folks all the time, what's old and when are you gonna be old? Right, I ask that question, you know what they say? It's universal, when I can't do for myself. And that's like the measure, right? So I'm gonna keep doing for myself and then when I become a caregiver, this is my job, if it's my, you know, my dad or my mom or my husband or my wife, I'm gonna, that's my job. I'm, just gonna, I'm not gonna ask for help, gonna keep doing it. 
And that's the mindset we're all in, and then, you know, we're, we, we, we end up in crisis, and so everybody around, whether it's healthcare, <laughs> or it's our town, uh, or it's our job that we have to leave, everything is a, a crisis, instead of figuring uh, how do we build communities that really are interconnected. And so that's where I think the discourse has to change from one of Yankee independence to Yankee interconnectedness. So we can all still stay out of each other's business. <laughs> we can agree about that, right? I mean, that's really the problem. <laughs> but we can understand that living in crisis, no matter where you are in the continuum, is bad. It's bad for all of us. It's really bad for the economy. Actually being planful uh, and helping people ask for help. Helping people by creating natural designs, whether that's within our communities, when we talk to communities and we say, why is it so hard to ask for help and what would help you ask for help? Uh, the answer is having, I can ask my neighbor once to take me to grocery shopping or my son um, can come help me once a week but he's got a family and blah, blah, blah. I mean, the stories are endless and you have all heard them, right? Uh, but if uh, there was a neutral place that I could call, if I could just call my church or the town hall and say I needed a ride and not feel like I was burdening somebody, but there was something there I could trust. That, and so, like, this isn't hard, right? I mean, we're building these things all over uh, the, the region. I, I would venture, I guess, we've got about 125 communities across the three states that are doing some sort of aging in place initiative. It's really exciting. Um, but I actually want to take the next step, which is to, and when I talk about the economy and I talk about our workforce, um, Yvonne said we have, uh, you have 178,000 in informal caregivers and 50% of them are employed. That's 89,000 people <laughs> are informal family caregivers in the workforce. Uh, and our workforce across our three states, um, we are, we've got a looming workforce shortage and it's significant, and you can go talk to any one of your employers and start asking them, how you doing hiring people? <laughs> and you're gonna hear pretty quickly, I need help with workforce, I need help with workforce, I need help with workforce. Uh, and the problem really right now is that th that's a, a conversation that's happening within the doors of uh, a particular business, um, and sometimes maybe the industry is starting to talk about it, but they're not getting the whole interconnected piece that we have a significant workforce challenge. And when you have 89,000 people <laughs> who are potentially employed by New Hampshire employers uh, who are struggling at work to continue to provide care and we have a workforce shortage, the story changes. We need them. We need those workers to be providing informal care. We absolutely need that. And we need them to stay in the workforce. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things we need to be doing is having conversations about uh, the opportunities. Because if we build work, uh, workplaces in New Hampshire and across the region where people feel supported, you're going to have the best workers in the world, first of all. Everybody knows if you give somebody a little bit of flexibility when they need it, they're, you're, they're there for a lifetime, you know. Uh, and so what family, informal fair, uh, family caregivers have said they need, Pretty simple stuff, flexible hours, flexible leave time, right? So that uh, if you need to take, you don't have to take all your vacation time before you can take sick time to take care of uh, your mother or your father. Uh, you may need to take some extended unpaid leave uh, if there's a, a hip fracture or a pelvic, pelvic fract fracture. Um, but there's more. Think about the thing that we've heard, we heard on the panel, but we also did, by the way, and I forgot to mention, we, we did a series of cross-border conversations on caregiving, the Tri-State Learning Collaborative did, and we just issued a 35-page report, which has really got a lot of great recommendations. There's a one-pager on uh, the booth in, in the back on my table. Um, but, you know, the ideas that came up around workforce pieces were really incredible because the one thing people don't have are access to resources, the resources that can help them. And if you are taking care of your mom with dementia every night and she, uh, you've got some plan for her during the day and you're working really hard during the day, when are you going to find the time to find the resources that will help you? Uh, and so the workplace becomes a place, right? HR departments are used to doing this stuff. 
the, the, your workplace could become a place where you can get easy access to information about caregiver supports. But it could also be a place of learning, right? Lunch and learns, I mean, how many people have been to a lunch and learn in their, in their business? I mean, this is something we do. What about having conversations about caregiving? What about actually having informal peer-to-peer -peer support groups? And I bet you that men would go. <laughs> I do, I think, you know, I mean, I think that there's something to be said for the fact that we have some opportunities here. We don't have to see it all as a challenge, that we have some opportunities to look at our work, at, at our work environments to say, what could this be? And what could we make? And, and if we value, and we should value the contributions that these 89,000 employed caregivers are giving to our state economy, and we value them as workers, we have to. It's an imperative. So that's, I'm going to be done now. <laughs> so I believe we have a couple of mics. So we could take a couple of questions. Melina's got one in the back, and Sue's got one over here also. So are there any questions from any of you? Because if you don't have questions, I've got at least two. Yes. The mic is on its way. And is there a particular panelist you'd like to ask the question of? You. Oh, me, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got you, my experts. You said at the beginning that there's a moratorium on nursing home beds in the state. I didn't understand what that statement meant. So there is a moratorium on nursing home beds because nursing home beds are paid for predominantly by Medicaid. And Medicaid is that particular uh, Medicaid program is housed in our counties. The counties pay for care for older adults in nursing homes. They also pay for care for people who are receiving the um, waiver services through Medicaid. And so consequently, there's a real reluctance to increase the number of Medicaid beds that we've got right now because of the cost and the need to add more money to the general fund budget. So it's an economic thing. But there, that doesn't apply to privately paid Right. right. Okay. How? No, it does actually. Oh, it, it does, does apply okay. to uh, because those that's what happens is people get admitted to private nursing homes because Medicaid patients are both in your county homes as well as your private nursing homes, and inevitably, if somebody's there for two, three, four right. years, they spend down and end up having to go on Medicaid. Yeah. So it's really to minimize that number of beds. Gretchen is looking at possibly doing an article on that in the future because it, it presents quite a problem for us and people when they're being discharged from the hospital right now are being sent further and further and further away from home because they can't find nursing home beds that will take them locally because some of your nursing home beds are also used for the purpose of skilled rehab care too. They're swing beds. So is there... And one thing I'm finding as well, um, especially in the southern part of the state, is that they may have beds available, they just don't have workers mm to right. serve yeah, right. the seniors in the area. So that's almost an artificial moratorium just because there, is, there aren't enough workers. Jess, you want to comment on that? Well, I'm just going to say, I mean, we, we, we actually have an entire wing of a nursing home that just came offline for this exact reason. So we have beds coming offline like crazy. It's not like they're offline, but, but we can't fill main care beds because we, you have to have a staff ratio, staff to patient ratio. And, if, and we can't, it's the same direct care workforce as across the long-term care continuum. So whether you're looking for home care or nursing home care, assisted living, if you don't have workers, you just can't provide the care. Hanuk, can you comment on that from your perspective and challenges you've had with trying to get your patients into nursing homes? Yeah, well, I mean, I can speak on, you know, just being in nursing homes. Uh, we, we do uh, visit um, our patients who are in six different nursing homes in just this area. Um, you know, wh what we do notice is that things are challenging. Um, you know, I, I think that there's definitely staff issues um, in terms of staffing. Uh, there's also a lot of... Uh, I guess a lot of charting that has to do, uh, that uh, I think nursing staff have to do. And what, you know, what I've heard from nurses uh, that's been working at the same place for maybe 20 years ago would be that, you know, that it, 
the, it's hard for nurses to be with patients um, because of the, um, the, the staffing as well as the, um, the charting that they have to do. People are a lot sicker, yeah. and you don't get into a nursing home unless you have a nursing home level need. Other questions? Hi, I'm Anna, yes. and I, um, this is a question for all the panelists and maybe other people in the room, and that is that um, in terms of trying to think about solutions and out-of-the-box thinking, it strikes me like my parents live in New York and my in-laws live in the Pacific Northwest, and I, I am somebody who would love to help other people, and I know that my mom, for example, you know, she wouldn't mind having somebody like me, but down in New York, and not necessarily family. So I think what I'm trying to say is that we often, you know, I read these stories, there was one recently in the Valley News where there was a woman talking about her family history, and she had all these stories that her kids didn't necessarily have the capacity for it, and I just wanted to reach out and turn and say, but I, I'm interested in that story. So I just want to encourage people to think that we don't have to necessarily look to our kin or our relatives and that maybe there's other people in the community that would want to be involved somehow, maybe want to learn um, to help also just kind of like a mentorship situation so that for those of us who know that maybe down the road we're going to be in um, preparing ourselves for what's to come. So I just want to encourage people to, th to think it doesn't have to be your relative necessarily. Thank you, Anna. That's a wonderful point that you make. And I think that one of the experiences that we've had that Gretchen has seen and Jess has seen in Maine is that so many communities are developing programs so they can support people who are aging in community. And the caregivers of the companionship is offered by community members, not necessarily by family members. I, I think yeah, one, of, one of the fascinating um, little teeny statistics is that uh, uh, boomers had 10% fewer children than the generation before them. Uh, so there's a whole bunch more childless older adults uh, that are coming into the world. And, uh, and you see, I mean, this is a, there's, there is this melting of the Yankee independence in some ways. You see a lot of boomers starting to plan, and I loved, Yvonne, your, you know, your whole uh, group there of, was pretty wide and big, and I think that's what we're, uh, we're thinking about these things. Who, are in my group, and so these neighbor, neighbors helping neighbors um, are building their own um, extended family. Uh, absolutely they are, uh, and they're starting to rely on each other and learn mm -hmm. from each other, which is really fascinating, and particularly when they're the intergenerational things, and they're helping each other without even having it be part of just the people who are doing the work, uh, and they're helping others, but it's, it's a really fascinating new community model that's coming up that I think would really support what you're talking about. And Anna, I know you live in the Upper Valley. I can give you a couple of places that would love <laughs> to know about you. <laughs> um, so there was one other question right here. Thank you very much. My name is Geraldine. Uh, my question is, I know like in the nursing home, the residents there uh, come together in the cafeteria, they eat together, they go in the community rooms, they socialize, they go to activity uh, rooms and socialize. There are nurses to overlook their health all the time. There are nurses or European who are giving medication at night and so on. Now, when these residents, uh, these, uh, these elderly people are be having home care and not in that environment where they meet and socialize. How are these services going to be, or how are they taken in the home so that they don't feel isolated? Eh? You know, some of them, like in the nursing home, you find them like those who went together in high school, they decide, oh, when we get old, we are going to go to that nursing home. <laughs> eh? And now they are no longer there. How, what, what is happening or what happens or what is going to happen? So your, your question is, when we have to take care of people at home, how are we going to keep them from being isolated yes. and providing some of the same benefits yes. that actually yes. people yes. get in nursing homes? Yes. 
So thank you very much for that question. And I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to respond to that question and maybe do it in the context of thinking about a policy change that we need to make in order to help make that kind of thing happen. Um, and it can be an institutional policy or it can be a policy that might be in a community through a municipal association or it can be at the state level. So, Hanuk, would you start? Sure. Thank um, you. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I, I think from, a, from the lens of the, from, from the clinical lens, uh, I think an area that we can improve on uh, to, to, to help patients and their family members find the resources that's available in the community is uh, to help educate the, the frontline provider teams about service link. Um, I think, you know, over the last two years, I've had opportunities to shadow service link members, uh, long-term care specialists, and um, just the amount of information that I wasn't familiar with, because you don't learn that um, in the medical training or residency training as much. Um, but so important to the caregivers um, and their families. So, okay, thank you, Hanuk. So, Gretchen, what about you? And we need to be efficient here because we only have yes, 30 uh, seconds. Uh, <laughs> somebody put it to me, I was up in Lebanon last week, and somebody put it so um, describing our attitude, this northern New England um, resilience that we have is that we've finally gotten people to start saying it's okay to ask for a ride to the doctor. The next step is to get them to say, hey, can I get a ride to the movie theater? Mm -hmm. Just the simple little thing of maybe it's not what I, it, it, what I need. It may not be just basic. It may be a little more. And I think you'll see that if we start asking that question, things will start to change. Thank you. Jess? So the short answer is we need a, a drastic culture change in housing and how we design and site housing. Uh, and particularly, we, uh, along with this Yankee independence comes, I live in a single family home. Uh, and, um, and so, and, and our towns for the last 60 years have said, hell no, you're not gonna change that. Um, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna make that into a multi-family home, God forbid. Uh, and sure as heck, we're not gonna develop uh, you know, areas. But what we really need, uh, as long as we have everybody living down every dirt road, uh, in our states, uh, but it's true. I right. mean, it's, there's a lot of people right. living down every dirt road in our states, and, and until we give them a real opportunity uh, to live in the town center, because they don't, that's aging in community versus aging at home, uh, and so as long as they have a place to go. So I would say bread and breakfast models uh, of assisted living are very interesting, uh, and you know, housing with supports, building your own sort of concept of multi-family housing for older adults. There's all sorts of things we can do, but it's gonna start at the community level with conversations. Okay. Thank you. So I just wanna ask a question of the audience. Are there any legislators here in the room? I don't see one hand. <laughs> so. Oh, he was here. Okay. We need to change that as a group. We need to start making our local policymakers aware of some of the needs that the panel has just spoken to and some of the needs that this group mentioned to us earlier. A lot of this can be addressed through public policy. So I want to thank the panelists so much for being here. And again, a thank you to all of you. So.